It must have been so frustrating to dead Ramiro. Feel so desperately that you're right. Yet to fail, nonetheless. I don't know what I'm doing about any of it. Yes, you do. You're onto something. And ironically, she's the only one of the Imperial Security Bureau who has the slightest idea of what's going on. Kessel, Fondor, targeting consoles from Jakku, proton warheads from Base K, the Steergard Star Path. Thinking that it was too random to be random. I know this. If I was them, this is how I'd do it. I'd spread it out. And that's just the nature of the Rebellion. Recall that the Rebel Alliance we saw in the first Star Wars was called the Rebel Alliance. And of course, the Rebel Alliance is exactly that, a Rebel Alliance. We learned in the Star Wars Rebels that the Rebel Alliance was an alliance of many different rebellions that sprang up organically under various worlds oppressed by the Empire. And it's notable that Mira, the one to observe the sparks that would later become the Rebellion. We are the spark that'll light the fire that'll burn the First Order down. Skywalker's doing this so we can survive. And to spark a rebellion, Luthen set up quite a formidable group of seven. Karis Nemec, true believer who wrote the manifesto. Given what happened at the end of episode 6, seems like this would be a significant manifesto. At least for Cassian's character development to the Endor that we saw in Rogue One. Another formidable member to the rebellion, a hardline opposition to the Empire that Arvel Skeen initially claims to be when he said that his brother's orchard was taken by an Imperial Prefect. I always hated the Empire. I don't really know what to call how I feel now. Of course, this turned out to be a lie. And again, a character trait to Andor that he's very light on the trigger. Something that the George Lucas canonical Han Solo could use to learn later in his life. Deal with it. An interesting observation was that had Cassian Andor be a woman and settled with carrying on the torch of Luke Skywalker's legacy, she would have been accused of being a Mary Sue. We know that Andor won't die until Rogue One. So he has this plot armor that will not allow to have his life in jeopardy. Which means, as intense as any Andor episode would get, there is absolutely zero threat of death. And thus, some might say, will reduce the stake at hand. It is as if the death in Star Wars would have any meaning at all. No one's ever really gone. Compounding the issue would be the fact that Andor is being shown to be competent with anything he dipped his filthy hands in. Kane is left-handed. You want your weapon on the outside. You don't know how to get it off the runway, do you? There's a load clutch. There's a gauge just below to read out the weight. <laughs> what were you gonna do if I wasn't here? Even Rey Skywalker kept failing again and again. Oh no. On oh, no, what? Wrong fuses. This was a mistake! Huge! He's also much better at shooting first compared to Han Solo, who was taught to shoot first early in his life. I hope you're still paying attention because now I'm gonna tell you the most important. But later experienced a significant character growth in which he canonically managed to unlearn how to shoot first. Compare this to Endor, who knew what to do even before the other guy finished his sentence and ultimately gets killed by a dweeb in his goth phase. Let it be known that canonically, Guido shot first, Han shot second, and Andor shot before. Deal with it. Thank you. So, knowing that Cassian cannot die before Rogue One, how did the writers for Andor create suspense? It's simple. Cassian Andor was just tagging along for the ride. I'm buying you critical redundancy. He was simply being a member of the team, instead of the leading hero of the Rebellion. But why is this even an issue? We know that Luke Skywalker is never going to die in the original trilogy. Even before The Last Jedi came out. Even in Superman movies, when we see Superman gets beat up and presumably dead, we know he's not going to die there, he's going to come back. Somehow Superman returns and beat up the bad guy in the end. That's just part of being the main protagonist. So even though we know that Andor has arguably even more powerful plot armor than Luke Skywalker ever did in the original trilogy, because we already know that he's going to die in Rogue One, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. You're not here to find out what happened in the end. For example, if you're watching a Game of Thrones, you're only doing it to see if your favorite character will die in the next episode. 
Not in Star Wars, not in Endor. You are here to find out how things fold out. That's story, and what they've served was beyond most people's imagination. We have seen heists in Star Wars before, but never with such in-depth character study. Even the Lieutenant Gorn got some pretty clever character moment from letting people to enjoy the eye instead of ordering them, thereby absolving him of suspicion. The backstory of how he lost his wife and missed out on some promotion, became very bitter about it, and got a nice schadenfreude moment at the end. You'll hang for this. Seven years serving you. I deserve worse than that. We get pretty close in terms of characterization in the three heists put off in Solo, but it didn't come near as much as the ones in Endor due to movie length versus episodic constraint. Obviously, and even A New Hope has some rudimentary elements in terms of characterization, but with religious indoctrination to radicalize a disenfranchised young farmer to blow up government facility. Which, if we should account for the deleted scene, Luke Skywalker should be considered involuntarily celibate. Don't worry about it, Wormy. Fleshing out the characters in Andor, we finally get two characters who are officially a lesbian couple and not just some background actors. Well enchanted homosexually is finally treated as normal. As it should be. What? Nobody in the universe bring it up as anything but a romantic relationship between the two individuals. And Sinta's name is another example of Star Wars drawing from Southeast Asian influence. In many Southeast Asian Malay and Malay adjacent culture, it is pronounced with a hard C, Chinta, which means love. And truthfully, it doesn't matter what your gender and sexual orientation is, love is love. Gay is now normalized in Star Wars, the conservative bigots have lost. And people should be proud to be woke, because this is what science fiction is supposed to do. It offers societal critic of many forms, and truthfully, the normalization of lesbian relationship like Sinta and Vol should be something that less advanced civilization learn to implement as the positive societal norm that it is. Through all of Star Wars, we got used to space battles with the TIE Fighters and their iconic sound. For most of their existence, TIE Fighters have always been toothless cannon fodder for their heroes to shoot down and not much else. But here's the thing, in Andor, all they did was put the TIE Fighter in patrol. And having those TIE Fighters flying low are not only awesome, Ben Burt's iconic sound design first time made it feel like that these TIE Fighters to be so menacing just by having it fly on such a low altitude and threatening posture feels so deadly. Had the pilot not been convinced that these group of people are just space goat farmers, the TIE Fighter would have obliterated them right then and there. It's the sort of subtle addition of little things, just by the mere existence of a bunch of space goats, which we never acknowledge nor directly refer to, it just sits there in the background doing nothing turned out to be an important deterrent for them not to get their butts gets blasted by a random TIE fighter. When Luke is going back to Coruscant, there's this scene where he put on his clothings and rings and wig. And is he preparing his mindset? And is he beginning to put up an act? Which is an interesting scene that brings up the question whether he's actually acting or was this his actual persona? From a certain point of view, can be argued that he was putting on an act when he interviewed Andor because he's taking an awful lot of risk by meeting Bix, a contact in the underworld that somehow wanted to sell him an NS9 star path. But as we discussed before, Bix was probably recruiting Andor for the cause. So was this tough persona that he's putting up here actual personality? Or was it something that he made up as a cover when dealing with something that is highly risky? And of course, he's putting on a show not just just for the art gallery, when he meet up with Mon Mothma, art gallery persona is a really charming person, the kind that you expect to find from an art gallery owner who's trying to unload his merchandise. His collection of artifacts from all over the galaxy, of course, gave him cover or excuse for him to travel all over the place to meet and recruit all kinds of people. And we know that this charming persona that he put up in front of the gallery was more of an act to fool people who might be spying on him or his customer. Because as soon as Luthen and Mazen Mothma moved to the back of the room, they immediately went down to business to discuss the funding of a rebellion. And as you can see, that Luton immediately drops to his serious persona, that his art gallery curator persona was just an act. But he's not exactly acting the way he did when he met Andor. 
This is just a serious meeting, and he's not putting on his aggressive persona. This ambiguity in Luthen's persona, or at least his superficial pretense when meeting different kinds of people, made him an interesting character. Shout out for costume design by Tom Wilkinson, famous for costume designing a lot of Zack Snyder's films. Subscribe!